absolute. Let everybody get in here. You ever notice when you hit these, there's certain sounds. It's always interesting. It's like crystal bowls. Reminds me of the same thing. Certain stones resonate at certain sounds, depending on what the cup is made out of. Clay is very interesting as well, too. Talk about a bunch of stuff today. Let everybody hop in here. We're building back better. That's what we're doing. That's what we're doing on this live today. <laughs> we're building back better. That's what it is. You're drinking the pearl and the dragon's blood. I like that. That's amazing. I've been putting pearl all over my skin. It's just remarkable. The pearl is magical. It's uh, it's one of a kind. Which, speaking of, we have something new coming with Pearl this week, which I'm really excited for. We have a restock of Lion's Mane coming this week. We had the restock of Dragon's Blood capsules, and those are pretty much just selling like crazy. We had the restock of Pearl capsules. Those are back in stock. And I think we have the restock of the Collagen Cognition and the other trios as well. Everything's going to restock this week. So it's an epic week. We are over Mercury Retrograde, which is great to hear, because the Mercury Retrograde was just making everything crazy. It was just spinning all the opposite direction and just making things goofy. I mean, you can definitely tell in the energy when the eclipse was over, the Mercury Retrograde was just eerie, like really just eerie and strange. And even outside, there wasn't as many people driving around. There wasn't as much traffic. There weren't people outdoors. It was just weird. Total strange like too not to say quiet but just eerie that's what i noticed but thankfully the mercury retrograde is over and all of the interesting polarity that was going on at the same time between the full moon and the eclipse and mercury retrograde are all over all at the exact same time but in the good news is like i was saying we'll have the restocks of all of our stuff and everything's going crazy this week and everything should be back to normal it's just been it's been non-stop you know, we're a small team, and we're all always trying to make things happen. What's up, Eric? It's, we're a small team, and we're always trying to make things happen, and, you know, we're trying to always do our best. And as we've been growing, and people have been sharing our videos, and the YouTube, and all the stuff that's been going on, I'm so thankful for it all, and it just keeps going like this, you know? it's We're pretty much just going like that. The truth is resonating very loud. That's the best way to describe it. You know, I think that's that's what people people want. They don't just don't want to be fed a bunch of BS anymore. You know, I think that's just what it is. And I think people are just kind of over it. And I think really all of this stuff we kind of faced in 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023, all of this, just people are just over it. They just don't want to be a part of it anymore. And I don't agree. I, I agree because like that video I shared today, building back better, blocking out the sunshine, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Why would we block out the sun to save the planet? You know, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And I think that's the thing is a lot of things don't make any sense anymore. And for that reason, people are looking for the truth and the real ways of things. And I'm going to talk a little bit today about a book. I got another one. Look at this one. This one's beautiful. This one, this one is stunning. And it's just, yeah, it's really cool. You know, when you go back in time, and you look through these books and you look through the information which was present presented i've realized the reason they don't teach any of this to us is because it would make us very angry that's actually what i've decided i've decided that the whole reason this narrative was not taught to us is because it would bother us in so many different ways because we would see the truth in so many ways there is one part in this book specifically, and I'm going to make some videos on YouTube, which I'm getting around to doing. I'm going to start making 15, 20 minutes uh, clips of different uh, different things, things related to this book and things related to history and all the stuff we haven't been told, right? There's a couple different parts in here. So there's one part in this book that talks about the radium. So this is interesting. If you use radium, you can have unlimited energy. So those old school fireplaces that we used to see in all those buildings, guess what? Those were energy little power plants. That's what those were, and they used radium inside of them, and this book talks about it. There's other things in this book. It talks about asbestos, which is interesting too. Asbestos and how asbestos is not what it seems. 
and people actually used to put asbestos all over their body, all over their clothes, and they could actually walk through fire and they would not get burned. So they had like socks that were coated in asbestos and they would not get burned, which is interesting. Now remember, we were told that asbestos is dangerous for us because it can give us lung issues. But now the question is, is was asbestos dangerous because when they do all their little fire nonsense, it could protect us in a way we haven't seen. Take it a step further. Then in this book, it talks about how lead pencils, remember they talked about lead pencils? If you stick somebody with a lead pencil, they'll get sick. Well, those lead pencils were actually graphite, which what is graphite connected to? The same stuff we saw in 2020 and 2021 going into people. Same composition, graphite, graph, the rest, you know the word. So pencils actually had graphite in them and the combination of the graphite with all the toxins were actually what was causing the toxicity. You know, so it's interesting thinking about these things and just kind of really rethinking a lot of stuff. And there was other stuff in here talked about natural healing. 1902, 1911 and all these different things. It's interesting because, you know, they talked about natural healing in here and so many different ways to naturally heal. Naturally healing using uh, the sun, using water, using salt, using raw milk, going out in nature, and then also using the mind to heal, right? Those are all things we're not taught about. We don't, we don't talk about any of that anymore. And it was all about the natural way in this. So it was really interesting with that part. There were some other things related to, oh, when you're getting, when you're having a marriage, when you're married and then you have your anniversary, what you're supposed to give people. And basically in the first year, you're supposed to give them cotton. The second year you give them, or the third year you give them some leather. The 30th year you give them pearls, which I thought was really interesting because we always talk about pearls and how pearls are so magical and healing and everything. But for wedding anniversaries, you're supposed to give 30, after 30 years, you're supposed to give pearls. Now what's interesting is it also speaks about in this book that after 50 years, you're supposed to give gold. Well, that's interesting because we, when we look back in time, you know, or we look at now, people give gold all the time, but it was supposed to be after 50 years. Now, what's also interesting is that 75 years, you're supposed to give somebody a diamond. That's interesting too, because when we think of our narrative now, it's like buy her a diamond or you know, buy them a diamond or buy, get the diamond. The diamond will last forever. Meanwhile, this book says you're supposed to give a diamond after 75 years. So it doesn't make any sense that we gave diamonds in the first year or even before the first year, right? So it's interesting, this, this, this twist on things. And it's just uh, stuff to think about, you know, really of how things were done in, for example, 1902, 1910, and then these different time frames. And it's just something, it just gives you a different way of thinking about things. And that's why I like these older books, you know, because they really show you a different way of seeing things, you know. And what was really interesting is they have a lot of Chicago World's Fair in this book. Right? So there's a lot of information about the World's Fair. And Chicago is showcased so many times. Right, Chicago, Chicago, Chicago. Almost like Chicago was a capital at one time. Now what's interesting is they talk about the Chicago Post Office in this book. And they talk about how the Chicago Post Office had 16 to 18 inch walls. Okay, Chicago Post Office, 16 to 18 inch walls. And it actually looked like a capital building which is fascinating that that was the post office building. But think about that, 16 to 18 inches wall, 18 inch walls. It also said that the buildings were all fireproof. That's interesting because what did we learn about Chicago? In about the 1800s, 1900s, you had that fire that's a, that was allegedly burning everything down after a cow kicked over a lantern and burned down all these buildings. But according to this book, the buildings were 16 to 18 inches. The, the, their walls were that thick and were fireproof. So that story doesn't add up. That's why I like going back into the past and looking at these books and these ancient books and, and stuff related to the past. Because when you get into it, a lot of the narrative in which we've been told does not add up at all, right? And the other narrative that doesn't add up in the part of the buildings is they talk about, this gets crazier. When you go to London, London has the Crystal Palace, right? It used to have the Crystal Palace till they destroyed it. But in one of the books, they mentioned that the Crystal Palace, which was built out of pure quartz, pure crystal, 
crystal and steel, right? This building was gigantic. It was one of the biggest buildings in the world at that time. This building was built for fun, they said. That's what they said. They just built it for fun, and then they destroyed it for fun. Just like a lot of the, the railroads and the trains and everything that was going on with that, right? A lot of those were destroyed for fun. They were just destroying things. So what happened was, was our history was rewritten multiple times, right? So someone told a story, and that story showed everything. And that's why I like pictures, right? Because when you see pictures, it kind of gives you a different way of thinking about things. And I'll see if I can open it. Oh, here's a real good one. I opened it on the perfect one. So this right here, if you can see that, let me see if I put that right in here. So this is a solar panel. And this is what's called a solar, solar furnace, right? So this is on page 296. This is in the year, let me see real quick. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh yeah, this is 19, 1910, right? So solar panels, 1910, you had solar panel type devices. Meanwhile, they're selling you an electric vehicle that only gets 200 miles to the range. Now here's what's fascinating too. There's cars in this book, right? There's cars. Cars from 1910, okay? Cars that drove up to 80 miles an hour and got 400 to 500 miles per gallon. Or sorry, no, to the tank. I said that, I said that, was, yeah, I got too excited. 400 to 500 miles per tank, right? That's 1910, 400 to 500. We don't, we got cars that don't even get 200 and it's 2023, right? And they're running off the same thing, petroleum. So as you can see, what's happened is technology would come out and things would be revealed. There's also things that talk about wireless telephones. Now this is where it gets good and I'll talk about that one next. But technology would be revealed, but they would suppress it and diminish it and remove it from teaching about it. Because if they taught other people about it, they would then mimic it, recreate it, and then sell it to everybody else. So what happened is, is there was a patent act, that was about 1950s, Invention, C Invention Secrecy Act that came out. That act came out so that they could block a lot of patents. So if a person went to go submit their information to the patent office, right, they would block that patent so that they would not be able to release it out into the public unless it was in a book. So, you know, you just, it's called, uh, as somebody just said, John, John just said, The World's Workshop. That's the name of the book. But, you know, they would suppress these patents and they would suppress this information. And a lot of this, and the, the thing is, too, is like when you look at these buildings, you know, like when you go back in time and, you know, we've had all these people or you got people who are like, oh, they could, they just built differently. They used heavier materials. You know, they had X amount of people. When you look at the population of the people, this book says that the population of Chicago in 1910 was about 1.5 million, right? So 1.5 million when you think about that, okay? That was the whole thing. And that's throughout the whole state too, right? Because you have all the states, of all of that as well too. It's not that many people, right? Even if you used all 1.5 million people at the same time to try to build all these things, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And then the real thing that really blows my mind with the stuff in this book and other books as well is the weight of things. There is a bell mentioned in this book. Okay, check this. This is crazy. And I'll talk about the wireless telephone next. There is a bell mentioned in this book from 1733. Okay, 1733. So think about 1733. Kind of picture that in your head. Picture like some people... I don't know, on horse and wagon and or, or just on a wood ship crossing the Atlantic out or the Pacific, whatever they're doing. Okay, the bell weighed 400,000 pounds. Okay, that's 200 elephants, right? I think I did that, 2,000 pounds. Yeah, it was 200 tons. So it was about two, 200, anywhere from 100 to 200 elephants. This was in Russia, right? There is a bell that's in, uh, yeah, there's a bell that's in Russia or near Russia that's over 400,000 pounds. Okay, if we had 100 elephants or 200 elephants, that would be the equivalent of that weight. Think of how heavy that is. Now let's take it a step further. 
You go to Montreal, there's a church or a cathedral in Montreal, and their, their bell is about, about 20,000 pounds, right? So 20,000 pounds, okay? So that is about one-tenth, my math's not too good today, about one, yeah, but no, sorry, one-twentieth of that bell in Russia, okay? 20,000 pounds, so compared to 400,000 pounds, right? So think about that. Then, now we're going to take it a step further. 1776 comes along, and supposedly the country has started and all this other stuff, and they create the Liberty Bell in Pennsylvania, and they ring the Liberty Bell, and they say, we have done it, and we have accomplished everything. The Liberty Bell only weighed 1,500 pounds. 1,500 pounds. But there's a bell created in Russia in 1733, as they say, 1733 that weighs 400 pounds. That's almost 300 times the weight of the Liberty Bell. And you can go to Google, look up the Liberty Bell, type it in, check it out, you know, all of that. Yep, as, as somebody's commenting in here, put it in there. Look at the, the weight of the bells. And I just went to a, uh, a, to a store the other day up in Cave Creek, uh, Carefree, Arizona, and they had bells for sale, right? Copper bells for sale. Those bells, I could barely lift the one. The one was probably 200 pounds. The other one was probably about 500. I mean, you can't even move it with your hand. So who was moving it and what was moving it, right? That's a small bell. That's only 200 pounds. Now imagine a bell that's 400,000 pounds. Now to take it a step further, of those bells is, as John was just saying, how did they cast it? Number one, that's what I was just going to start speaking about. But number two, in this book, they mentioned how the bells were made out of gold and silver. Gold and silver. Think about that. Like, you just sitting in, <laughs> just sitting hammering away, smelting, cooking. You know, 400,000 pounds of gold and silver is worth a lot of money, Right? So it doesn't make a lot of sense when we think about it that that's just floating up in the air, just ringing, right? You're just <laughs> making some sound. And you can look this up. It's the bell in Russia. It's like 400,000 pounds. It's, it's insane. And I looked it up and I put it up in our story. So, you know, when we look at the, what we've been told, right, and how we build and all of this in which we do, you know, nothing adds up. And what I've started to realize is with these kinds of books and all the information that I've been kind of gathering in the last X amount of time is that there's two timelines, basically, right? There's two completely different timelines. One is a timeline of a super advanced, like almost like Super Saiyan Goku advanced, I guess, race that could do things that we could not imagine, maybe levitate, maybe float, maybe carry things, maybe lift things with frequency, maybe, maybe 20 to 30 to 50 feet tall. I don't know. I have no idea. All I know is to do the things that they're doing requires a good amount of size, strength, and intelligence, right? So you have this very advanced society over here. And then when you get into the books and you look at the people in the 1900s who are living in downtown Paris, who are living in downtown London, who are living in, in Chicago, who are living in New York, right? Those people have no idea what they're even living in, right? They're on this side over here, and they're building with sticks, wood, and concrete, which is another Rockefeller patent, right? Concrete is Rockefeller patents. So they're using concrete and stone, or concrete and wood and some other stuff. And it, this, this book was talking about how they're like making trunks and things to make like suitcases and clocks and a, a bunch of stuff that, I mean, I, I get it. It's at that time. But if you see what they're living in, it doesn't make any sense that they would be sitting around making clocks or things of that nature when the buildings are so advanced, it's not even funny. Like, And what's even crazier is some of the pictures, you got this massive building, and there was one part in this book, right, that they talked about that. They said that the building was so large that the they can't, they, they, support, they, they said, they allegedly, they can't build it again because the floor is too, like, mushy right? Too mushy. So think about that. 
okay? So the floor is too mushy and you can't replicate it, but they're building all over the place. Let me actually see if I can find a picture because now it's gonna drive me. Oh, here we go. So this is in Chicago and this is the railway station and you see those that that building, right? And then these people don't even have a road to walk on. It's just mud, but you built buildings which there's a, there's a there's actually a, there's a, a clock at the top, and then the people are just walking around in horse and wagon, and they're in their little like attire and their cute little clothes, and they just seem so out of place, you know. That's kind of what I realized. It was kind of like there's a lot of out of place things when you go into these books, right? Because if you could build buildings that are so advanced that are so intricate, that are made out of pure granite, pure sandstone, pure all these things, right? And as somebody just said, huge sidewalks too. Yeah, why do you need such large sidewalks? Or is everybody gigantic? You know, things that don't make a lot of sense. And same thing when you look at the buildings, if you could build like that, right? If you could sculpt, because I'm not even calling a building anymore, I've realized it's sculpting. But if you could sculpt like that, then why would you not have, why would you not pave the road? Right? Unless you were not, unless you were flowing, floating. Maybe you're floating over that. Maybe the, maybe there was materials in the soil which would allow your, your ship or your boat or your car to float. Questions to be asked. And, you know, the more you get into it, the more you just, it's just crazy because these buildings are all over. The other thing, too, is here's one, Pillsbury. You guys know that brand, good old Pillsbury. They hijack that building right there. So that is the Pillsbury building. And it says how much food they were also producing also at this time, which is interesting because everything is just gigantic. You know, when you go into this building and you look at everything, everything is massive, right? And like for us little little people, because it kind of reminds me, and here's the, the car I was telling you about. There's that, that fast car thing goes, uh, it says it can drive 400 and check this. 415 miles, the picture I just showed you, at 70 miles an hour. And this is 1911. Meanwhile, you can't even get 20 miles to the gallon in your car. And we got, you know, electric hybrids, whatever nonsense they tried to sell you and whatever else. But this is, I mean, you go into this and the thing is, is like, yeah, everything was huge. And, you know, when you think about how huge everything was, you have to sit there and wonder who built all of it. Because it's so gigantic. But, you know, what's interesting is they do have some funny stuff at the end back here about some dinosaurs. Let me see if I can just pull them up real quick. Uh, no, I won't be able to find it in time. But there's a lot of, there's a lot of dough. Yes, that is a lot of dough. That's what's interesting. Everything was so large. So you sit there and look at it and go, everything was gigantic. But the people were so small. And... As somebody just said, dude, we're the most advanced we've ever been. Exactly. We're just so advanced with our technology that we're using microwave technology to cook our bodies every single day, right? We're very advanced. We, that's what we're doing. Or we're blocking out the sun so that we can save the planet because we're very advanced. So, you know, just funny stuff like that. But with this whole book, it's interesting because the one last one I'll talk about in here is that they talk about how, this is the book if you want to see it, The World's Workshop. That's the name of the book. So the other one is the wireless telephone. And this is by, I forget his name. I think it's Stubbenfield. Doctor, no, it's not doctor. It's Mr. Stubbenfield. They always have some funny names. But Mr. Stubbenfield basically invented a wireless telephone in 1910, right? That what, what you would do is you would take a rod and you would stick that into the earth with some copper and you would place that into the earth and you'd be able to pick up the phone and he doesn't even have a phone. He's just got a cord and he's just got a little speaker system and he plugs it into the earth and as he plugs it into the earth, he could talk to people for over thousands and thousands of miles away by communicating using the Schumann resonance of the earth, 7.83 hertz. So think about this, we have wireless telephones in 1910 and 1911. Meanwhile, we're put in towers every 50 feet so that we can communicate better and whatever else. But they were showing that you don't even need wires 
you don't need any of that. And that's what I started to realize. A lot of the technology that they showed and a lot of the things that they describe in this book, they also mention we don't need half or two thirds of all the stuff that we have if this, all these things went into creation, right? If we started using this, what's interesting is at the same time in which Stubbenfield was making his wireless technology with his uh, little phone booth thing that he was making, Marconi was creating the radio at the exact same time. So what you had was, was you had Stubbenfield over here with wireless, beautiful technology using the Earth's frequency because he understood that you could use the Earth's frequency and connect into the Earth just like the Navy does. If anybody doesn't know that, what happens is the Navy actually uses the 7.83 hertz that goes around the Earth so that they can communicate all over the world. That's how they communicate deep in the ocean too. They use 7.83 hertz. But anyway, so you have Stubbenfield over here, and he's creating this wireless, beautiful technology that uses the Earth's frequencies because he said, why don't we just use the Earth's frequencies to communicate because it only makes sense. And then you have the Marconi over here who decides, let's just put these radio antennas all over the place, and we'll just use radio, and we'll send radio signals all over. And what's interesting is Marconi actually died he had multiple heart attacks, okay? And this goes back into the book, The Invisible Rainbow, because they actually mention it in there. But Marconi died of multiple heart attacks. Stubbenfield lived, right? He used the natural earth technology. He was living and doing pretty, or being pretty. And then you have Mr. Marconi over here who died when he created the radio. So this is how different, and that's why I say it's like it's two different timelines separating one another. You have one group of people or advanced societies or groups that were very unified and were building all over the world. And then you have this totally disconnected side, which doesn't even know what they're even a part of, right? And so when we look back in time and we go to look at Chicago and New York and Paris and all of these cities, all of these people who are living in these cities don't fit the city that they're living in. There's so much advanced technology that they don't fit the city that they're living in because they don't they don't know how it's how it's made. And what's interesting is there was one other part in this book as well, too, where they talked about Easter Island and how the people of Easter Island. And this is 19 this is 1902 Easter Island. The people of Easter Island don't even know how the stones of Easter Island with the big faces were actually crafted and sculpted and placed onto the island, right? So there's a lot of stuff when you go back into time and you look at things that does not add up to the timeline in which we were told. And so what they try to do is, what I've realized is every 10 to 15 years, they try to do these events, right? 2020 was one of them, where they try to do these events where they get rid of information and they try to lead us a different way. But the cool part is, at least what I feel is happening, is now society has actually shifted this way. Society has shifted towards the electric culture, towards the energy, towards the healing, understanding the foods, understanding growing, homesteading, getting connecting with nature. Right now it's like a total shift. That's what's happened. And I think they thought that it would go this way, but in reality, people are definitely going back this way. And I think it's going to lead to a lot of innovation. I had a, I had a guy tag me in a kid's video. The kid is like, I think, I think the little guy is like eight years old or nine years old, and he's doing electroculture, and his squashes are just gigantic, and he already got them in May. So, you know, the next generation of children are going to know electroculture, going to understand energy principles, right? And they're going to get connected more than ever, right? Because even with all of this, right? If you sell somebody these smartwatches and these ear pods and all this goofy technology that we don't even need because your brain can do all those things so we don't need any of that. But if you sell all of that, what you're doing is you're disconnecting the people, right? You're disconnecting the body from, as we talked about in the past, you from being a human, right? You being part of humanity and your soul and all of that. What's happening now is there's a shift where people are kind of over all that, and now they're kind of moving back towards this way. 
And I say that because people are getting into energy more. I see so much. The cool thing is, is even the stuff I've been posting with the electroculture, people have now been tagging me in pictures of animals sitting by the antennas, right? So I had a friend, she sent me a message that her uh, German Shepherd is sitting next to the antenna and just sleeps next to the antenna all the time because animals can pick up on the frequency. And as we uplift the energy, animals can pick up on that. I've had multiple people send me cats. Cats love sitting next to the antennas, right? They, they know that there's energy there. They know that the earth is in a better spot. So they want to sit there because they, remember, animals will do things to survive. They understand energy too as well. If energy is very healing, they will sit there and they will heal in those spots. So cats have been sitting there. My buddy up in New York sent me a message yesterday saying he had some bears and some deer, a bear and some deer in his backyard by his antennas. And now he's got birds sitting over there. And I had another person send me another video. And like I said, I get a lot of videos with them. But another person sent me another video where birds made a nest next to the electroculture antennas. So think about that. And then little babies are in the, in the video and you can see the little babies, but think about all of that. So while we have all this nonsense technology, right? And the stuff that we really don't need at all, there's actually no use of any of these things actually, because we could just be doing things in a natural healing way. The cool part is about everything that I've been talking about with the electroculture and with everything related to, excuse me, and with everything related to energy, right? It's growing faster and faster. And I just went up to my buddy's house. He lives a little north of here in Arizona. He's doing electroculture and he's doing different types of coils and different types of antennas. You know, I get messages from people all over the world trying electroculture, every continent, every language. I even use Google Translate so I can start to, so I can speak to everybody. But every single language, every single place is the information is getting out. And like I said, it spreads and it shares and it's magical and it's getting people connected back to their creative sides. Because when we go back in time and we look at this book that I was mentioning in the beginning, when we go back in time, the, the, the creativity side of, of humanity, when they were in this place in which they didn't know where they were living, right? Like they're like, they got all these big buildings, but they're confused on when they're living or where they're living. Their creative side was just going crazy and they were trying to figure out how they could replicate a lot of the technology. You know, when you look at a lot of the people who came out with a lot of patents from 1900s to 1950s, who, for example, were living in America, right? They were already living in like a golden age time. The buildings and everything around were all like golden age, right? But they were trying to figure out how they could replicate them. That's where you get into like the dynamos which were these gigantic energy conductors. There's also acetyl, uh, no, acetylene gas. That's what they used to use in all the lamps. I'll have to, I'll have to get that one and put that one in here. But once you start getting into it, you start then, as somebody just comment, com commented, conductors, antennas, electroculture, you know, old world buildings. You start seeing all these different things with these old world buildings, how they used to have mercury up at the top. They used to have an antenna. They'd had a conductor. It would run down and there'd be a little, you know, a wire all connected. They understood the energetic principles. So we're connecting back into our, we're connecting back into what's deep in our soul, right? There's more than just like ancient 23 or whatever that 23 and me whatever that, that that thing is where they tell you whatever you are where they're like oh you're from europe and whatever else there's much more to that right there's much much more to that that's just a, that's another thing just to keep you occupied so they can tell you what you're where are you from and whatever else meanwhile when we go back into lineage we go into our blood we go into you know the times before things were very very advanced you know society was insanely advanced. I mean, even if you look at some of the Vedic scriptures and stuff that was going on in India, right? They had, they had buildings or they had buildings that were flying and they used mercury inside of them so that they could cause them to levitate. And look at, just go on, for example, go to Google, type in India stone temples and India stone structures and look at the feats of just beauty and just design and the amount of material that they were using, right? They were using pure stone. Stuff weighs thousands and thousands of tons. They, they weren't sitting around hammering 
and they were sitting around with the chisel and just sculpting it out. It's, it's not anything of what was occurring because the symmetry and the beauty of these buildings are so perfectly detailed. It was like, like I said, they were sculpted or they were printed. And that's the same thing that was shown in these books, you know, and it's all of this stuff was there, but it was lost over time, you know, and it's, it all relates back into frequency and same thing about, like I said, whatever you drink out of, whatever you eat from, whatever you wear, right? Whatever you sleep on, whatever frequencies are beaming through your home, right? All of these things, whatever you eat, right? The food that you eat is a frequency. The water that you drink is a frequency, right? All of these things are frequency. And when we understand that they were elevating their frequency the entire time living in a or living in a stone building that's pure granite that has so much quartz in there that is compressing and creating energy think of the healing properties right think of the healing properties and that's why i like dr sam's work with the bosnian pyramids and everything that he's doing you look at dr sam or dr samir on, on his bosnian pyramid stuff he's showing how people are healing in the bosnian pyramids underneath the tunnels people would go inside the tunnels and they would begin to heal like that because of the fact that they're getting all the beautiful negative ions, right? There's all the beautiful clays and materials that are all in there and are underneath the tunnels. You know, that's the thing, like you really look at the frequency and the vibration that was being emitted. And if you look at these old, like I said, those sacred buildings in India too, imagine the resonance and frequency of walking in there, right? Because the water of your body takes on whatever you're around, right? That's why when we go out in the sun, we get energized, we get charged, we charge our battery, right? That's why they spend a lot of time trying to block the sun and tell you not to go in the sun because the sun is dangerous. I've been in the sun now last three days, two hours a day, so six hours. I mean, I'm charged up like no other. I mean, you need, you're need you just ready to go and sharp as can be. And that's, that's the healing powers of the sun, right? And it's a frequency, same thing. Just like you have the frequency of the eclipse, the full moon, Mercury retrograde, all of these things are frequencies. And as somebody was asking about sleeping, when you're sleeping on your bed or whatever it may be, it should be made out of wood. And then you should use natural materials like wool. You can use cashmere, you can use linen, you can use kapok. Those would be the ones that I would say to use. The You can use hemp if you can find it. And then if you have sheets, you wanna make sure that your sheets are made out of linen so that they do not gather a static charge while you're sleeping, right? I always talk about that one, everybody with restless leg syndrome, that can be easily fixed overnight with linen sheets. Simple, nice and simple. But your bed is a frequency, right? Your sheets are a frequency. If you can see those, they're linen. Linen is such a beautiful healing frequency. There's so much light that comes off of linen. So while we sleep, if we sleep in linen, right? I'm just showing this. If you sleep with linen, you're sleeping in the light, the light healing frequencies, which are being emitted from the beautiful fabric the entire time. The other cool part about linen is that it stays very cool. And I'm getting really hot because it's, <laughs> it's 100 out, but this is, this is uh, organic cotton. But with this situation with the linen, it stays very cool, right? So if you're wearing linen, during the day, you can stay very cool when it's summertime. Also, depending on you know how, if it's like more humid by you, linen would be a great option too, so that you can have your um, body just be in balance, right? A lot of, when you look at the ancient scriptures and you go into these ancient books, if they're even correct or not, but the one thing that I always notice in those ancient scripture books and all of these things is that they're always wearing linen. They would wear linen down their chest and then like this way, and they would wear usually purple, amethyst or purple, the royal purple colors, and they would wear that on their tunic or their linen tunic or linen robe or whatever you want to call it. But they always wore linen. And that's because linen and the healing frequencies that come from it are magical. They help to you know heal the skin, heal the body, heal the brain, and because it cannot conduct in the same sense as, for example, cotton, wool, and other different materials, it doesn't get as hot. That's what's nice too. So linen is one of my favorites. And I think somebody just said about my fan going, 
It's funny that you say that about that, Alan, because I cannot sleep if my fan is not on. And that's because I get so hot. I run really, really hot, like really hot. And then sometimes it'll be like the complete flip side. But for the most part, really, really hot. But the fan, I got to have it going. It just, it always feels just, there's something about having wind, you know? If you really think about it, who wants to sit in a stale place like <laughs> with no wind moving, right? Like there's nothing going on. There's no breeze. It's just, it would be you're just sleeping and just kind of, yeah, it just wouldn't be fun. You got to have something, I guess. But the cool thing is you can always rotate the settings and you can switch it so it spins back the opposite direction. I believe in the springtime you're supposed to make it, oh, this is one I got to pull into my brain. So I think in the springtime you do clockwise on your fan. I think on the winter time you do counterclockwise on your fan so that it spins back the opposite direction because that's another thing, right? And even with the fans too, most fans that you buy always spin one way. They never let you only spin back. It's only the ceiling fans actually that you get to change the spinning or the direction. Some of them probably don't even have that setting anymore because they, you know, they try to get rid of everything. They'll sell you a microwave but they won't sell you a fan that will go the opposite direction and, and switch it back. But as for the fans, yeah, for me, it's always felt, I feel I feel good. But I, if I don't have a fan on, then I kind of feel, just it just feels stale to me. just need fresh air. I'm real big in the, the fresh air thing. And that's why I always got the windows open. Just, yeah, always as much air as possible. No air conditioning. I mean, it's 100, no air conditioning. You know, no, none of that. Because that also, same thing, frequency, right? It's it's fake cold air and our body is not meant to be in it. And if I'm in air conditioning for an extended period of time, I almost turn like a frozen ice cube. And it doesn't even have to be a, a, a long period of time, but because of our, our bodies, when you're not in it, you see how messed up it is, right? Like because we're creating fake air and then it's cold and it's going into our air. It's just, it's, it's not good. We're supposed to be breathing the natural air because all the beautiful negative ions, when we start making all this fake air and everything else, it creates a lot of issues. Same thing with the heat. You know, a lot of people get a lot of allergies with heating systems because of all the dust and all the other stuff as well. You know, same thing. It's pulling the th thing through. Instead, you get some cashmere blankets and you'll be toasty as can be. You know, just bundle up. Right? That's kind of, and, and that's what our bodies are meant to do. When we're changing the temperature too much, we're now messing with how our natural rhythm is. You know, of let's say we're 98.2 degrees or whatever that number is that we're allegedly 19, or 98 degrees, whatever. But let's say we are that, right? If we start messing with that and we're messing with our temperature, we can actually mess with our body as well. And that's the other thing. If I sit in air conditioning for too long, I just feel messed up, like sick just gross like just did you know first when i'm sitting out in fresh air i could sit out in it all day for eight hours ten hours whatever it may be just natural and I, and that's i think another part of our disconnect is like i was saying with the book it's the same thing you know in here we're having the disconnect of the you know what we're living in and how we should be living and then we've created technologies which in my opinion don't make sense and kind of go against how our bodies work. You know, it's kind of like building out all these materials too as well. When you look into the, the different materials and the frequencies and the, the the things that come about, right, from all the different things, it's like, it doesn't make a lot of sense. If everybody in the 1900s was building out of granite, sandstone, and all types of beautiful stones, why on earth will we start building out of plastic and all kinds of things that don't resonate with us? Unless there were things in which took place where things were reset and there were events that took place and then the people forgot. And then they had new people come in. And then they told them some different stuff. So it's interesting. Definitely some interesting stuff. Someone said, uh, never sleep with the window closed for sure. Yes, that's that's how it is. You've got to have fresh air. It's just you got to have things moving around and just, just got to have. It's like, yeah, it's just how we're supposed to be. Just connected with Mother Earth. Like, it's just all there, you know, just calling out to us all the time. And I see people, they'll go out in the sunshine and they're all bundled up and they'll cover their whole area, like everything. And they'll put like hats and all kinds of stuff. They're afraid of the sun. It doesn't make any sense. Nature is not going to hurt you. If anything, I mean, I can name about a billion things that are trying to hurt you. But nature and the sun and fresh air and all these things, 
just are very healing and especially grounding. And I talk so much about barefoot grounding, but go out into nature and sit in barefoot ground for, and put your whole body, lay like, like kind of like a starfish, right? Lay like a starfish on the ground, just, you know, arms out, legs out, put your head back, take off your clothes, whatever, lay on the ground and do some barefoot or naked grounding, whatever you want to call it. And I will tell you, you will feel just so rejuvenated in so many different ways, you know, and it's just, and the thing is, is even if it, and somebody was saying it can be colder by them too, even if it's colder, your body will adapt to whatever temperature it is out there, right? It's only initially cold when you go to step a foot onto something, but your body will actually start to adapt. A lot of times we have cold or aches or pains and things like that because the energy is not flowing in that area anymore. So when you begin to barefoot ground, you actually start to rotate those cells back the opposite direction and it starts to heal and your body begins to heal and that inflammation starts to go away because the cells start spinning back the opposite direction. Of course, the cells now are spinning in this uh, negative direction and then that causes a lot of pain and inflammation. So barefoot grounding can just do so much. It also opens up the brain. It just, it just gets things just off, off of your chest. That's the best way to describe it, right? Because we're holding up so much because we live in a society with a lot of ping, 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 notification email, ding, 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 you know, all this stuff. And that's all too much. And we need a balance of things in which, you know, really starts to reconnect us and then also allow our mind not to have that because too many notifications and too much of all of that is also not healthy and that's not a good thing and we have to really get ourselves back to nature and i've been seeing so many people go out and barefoot ground and getting back and it's amazing and just getting the blood going they put their feet in the earth and they take photos and videos and then they're puppies and then they do it and think about dogs actually this is a perfect example okay Dogs, right? Let's go with that because actually this is a perfect example. Dogs have these like little foot boots things nowadays and they make them wear these boots and those boots are disconnecting the dog from barefoot grounding, right? The dog is always grounding. Think about the, the, the dog. The dog is always grounded all the time. That's why dogs are very healthy. But when you give them boots and it's maybe, you know, that let's just say an unnecessary thing. Let's say it's too hot. They can't walk. I, I, I get it. But the thing is, is it might become all the time, right? And then that dog is always wearing those things. So the dog is not grounding, you know? So it's important to, you know, be aware of these things. And a lot of these clothes, right? A lot of our clothing, if they're made out of polyester, polyurethane, plastics, all these things, they're blocking the ability for you to ground as well. Pl plastic blocks ether, right? So all energy that's flowing, that's ether. Plastic actually blocks it all. So if you wear, for example, polyester clothes while you do barefoot grounding, you're actually blocking the ability for the energy to transfer through your skin and through your cells. So that's why it's important to take as much off as you can, depending on where you are, but take as much off as you can and get as connected to the earth as possible. That's why even just hugging a tree is definitely one option for people who it's very challenging for them to barefoot ground. Just go and hug the tree and hold the tree, you know, for 20, 30 minutes. And then just close your eyes, sit there, you know? Someone might ask what you're doing and you should tell them you should, they should hug a tree too. But you just sit there with your eyes closed and you'll connect. You will connect to that tree. That tree will provide you with information. It's part of, partially why we're not told out to go out into nature with our whole you know, Rockefeller educational system and they only give like kids like 20 minutes of going outside, if they even do anymore. I don't even know if they do that. I think they got rid of all that in physical education and everything else. But if they do go outside, it's like 15 minutes and right back in. But, you know, part of connecting to nature, and like I was saying with the hugging of the tree, is your, not only is your mind connecting to the tree, but you're, you're exchanging data and information and also energy the entire time, right? When you're touching that tree with both hands, you have your positive side, which is your your positive conducting side and then you have your left side which is usually your grounding side and if you're lefty it's the opposite just so so you guys know but those two are a positive and negative right split down the metal and that's actually what causes all like the little um colics in people's hairs you got vor vortexes and vortices in people's hairs but anyways when you go to touch the trees you want to touch with both hands because you want to create the circuit the circuit between yourself and the trees. You don't want to just kind of touch with one side 
because the energy is not flowing right right back to the other side because they flow like a U or kind of like a circuit. And that's what we are, one gigantic circuit. So our clothes, our food, our water, our materials can all impede the ability for that circuit to function. And that's why people start to come down with all different types of illnesses is because the cells are not functioning in the electrical circuit anymore. And what happens is once you start healing and bringing back that circuit, they start going back the other way and they begin to heal. That's why Dragon's Blood works so well, Pearl, Shilajot, you know, all of our products related to that because everything is on an energetic principle. When you start turning on certain pathways and certain connective points again, right, all these different connective points in your skin and different connective points in your neck and these things and your guts and your, and your, and your, your, your limbs, when you start turning all those back on, all of a sudden the body begins to heal like that. And that's why, like I said, None of this stuff is really talked about because it competes with a system which is just trying to make money all the time. And relating it all the way back to the beginning of this with this book, right? A lot of the stuff that's in this book is not on Google. It's not on the internet. And my question is, is, hmm, well, why is it not on there? And the reason it's not on there is because it competes against the information in which they are trying to send to us, right? Every time you go onto a search engine and you type something in, it is attempting to try to tell you what to search for. It says recommended, right? Or recommended video. Because every time a recommendation comes, your brain goes into a certain state where it's already been shown what it needs to be shown so it doesn't think anymore, right? Because it's a recommendation. And they start to learn your patterns or habits and things that you might be looking into. So then what happens is, is you start to get these recommendations and you start clicking on them, when in reality, you first originally went onto Google to say 1902 wireless telephone. But then all of a sudden, now you're in this whole <laughs> rabbit hole of, uh, you know, 47 different ways to eat a piece of pizza. You know, you, you, you kind of get shifted over here because you're like, I, I love pizza, you know, pizza, I make my own pizza. So you get shifted over here, and yes, as, as Zach just said, the matrix. That's what it is. The matrix is pulling you right back in. But you have to center yourself. You have to ground yourself. You have to connect with nature, and you have to get out in the sun, and you have to be with nature. Because when you're out there, your brain will start to completely see things differently and not, what would be the word, take on what you're being placed into. Right? That's why they do so much with all the toxins and all the poisons and all the other stuff. They gotta keep people frequencies down. Because once their frequency goes this high, they're unstoppable, right? But when their frequency is down here, they're a lot easier to control. And then as Zach just said, go into the into the matrix, right? Because you get all these recommendations and you're like, Oh, I'm clicking all those, I'm reading through those. But if you spent, let's say, two hours out in nature, just on the flip side, you're gonna come in and be like, YouTube? I don't know. I don't know. I might learn something today, but maybe I'm going to go read a book, right? You're going to go do something different. Your habit changes. And I say this because it's happened with me. I did a thing where I did 30 days of grounding for 30 minutes a day with no technology whatsoever. It has changed my world on looking at nature and everything out there. And I, I highly recommend everybody just try it. You will see such a different perspective of things. You will see where your time is going too. Right? A lot of our time gets taken up in this side on that, like as Zach was saying, that matrix side, right? But we need to shift our time towards looking into the past, you know, coming up with our creative side, opening up our minds, connecting with one each other, loving one another, right? Showing love to people. Even if a person is having a bad day, right? Because I get a, quite a few of those people on Instagram and YouTube, they're always having a bad day and they come in with their wonderful having a bad day energy. I always just come back with best wishes. I love you and I hope you have a great day. Because you know what? Maybe that's what they need, right? That's what we should be giving to one another. That's what social media should be doing. Loving one another and caring one another because that's also a part that gets turned off in our whole educational system. Our educational system suppresses the heart and the heart chakra. It disconnects that, it disconnects that, right? When do people say positive things to one another? It's not taught, right? If you're in school, they just keep reprimanding you and keep telling you that you're a bad kid. 
they really don't reward children in the way of positivity and uplifting and creativity. Like, oh, you created that? You should try creating this next and then keep uplifting them. No, they're like, oh, that kid could probably do it better. And it just keeps shifting. And so what happens is, is that that positive love aspect, like the, the as somebody just said, the empathy, that is just completely removed. So as we start to bring that back and we start to have compassion and we have love and we have creativity and we have all these things, we generate an entirely different society. And we also generate an entirely different terrain, right? That's what the electroculture movement is doing as well. It's entirely generating a different terrain. The animals are responding to that as are the plants and everybody's gardens and all those things. But the entire uplifting of Mother Earth is also occurring at the same time. So with this whole entire thing, because I just went on a wonderful long rant on all of these things, it's important to just, like I said, as Jill just said, yes, you should give them kindness. Lots and lots of kindness. Lots and lots. Because you know what? Yeah, like if you're having a bad day, maybe you just need some kindness. I don't know. You need some love. You need some compassion. I'm better off giving you that energy than feeding into the energy in which you're trying to take, right? That's the other part. They're trying to take the energy from you. They're not just writing something or they're not just commenting or they're not whatever. They're not just having a bad day. They're also trying to take your beautiful energy. And we just keep up in the frequency. So that's kind of how I see it. And this whole entire point of today, I guess I would call this one the world's workshop and what I learned with the world's workshop. But I wish you guys all a great Monday, as always, a happy moon day. We don't have a full moon for a little bit, so it's a little bit time. But on the good news is, like I was telling in the beginning, we have all of our stuff being restocked this week. We have our lion's mane being restocked. We have our dragon's blood capsules, which are back in stock and we've been flying off the shelves. We have our pearl powder capsules, which are back in stock. We have our collagen cognition trios, which are all back in stock. Everything is going to be an absolutely amazing week this week. And I wish you guys all a great week and a phenomenal one, as always. I always try to bring out the, you know, bring out the positive in all of this nonsense that we face, even with building back better. We're building back better without sunshine. <laughs> but, you know, I can't help but laugh. That's kind of how I see it. We have to stay positive. Because what will happen is they always want us to come down into their frequency, and we're not doing it. We're being above that. We're rising above, and we're always going to keep creating awareness, solutions, positivity, and spreading love and compassion for others. Because that's what's needed as well. They want us divided. They want us conquering each other. They want us arguing about the goofiest things that none of this stuff even matters. But we're not going to do that. We are staying positive, spreading love, spreading compassion, spreading joy, happiness. If you see something funny, post it up. You know, you might make somebody's day. And as Zach just said, let's build back old world technology. I like that. And I'm going to end, that, end this one on that. You can find this video on Telegram. It'll be on YouTube. It will be on Rumble. And if you haven't came to our YouTube channel, come. It's awesome. It's been growing. Everybody's been sharing the videos. And I, I try to answer everybody's comments. And, and just keep going through. But if you haven't joined, come check us out. But I wish you guys all a great rest of the week. I will see you next Monday, 4 p.m. Yukon time. And make sure you go out there, get in nature, and get in the sun. Till next time.